when you exercise that creativity muscle, you're able to come up with experiments. How can I experiment to improve this aspect of my knowledge or life or whatever? So for instance, with comedy, again, I was having a hard time coming up with one-liners. Like I'm, I'm a public speaker for a long time, so that means I'm good at storytelling and humorous storytelling, but coming up with one-liners, it's one sentence that gets people to laugh. That wasn't an expertise of mine. So here's an experiment I did. It took a half hour. I went onto a subway and every stop I moved from car to car in the subway and I would do stand-up comedy in the subway. And now no other person sitting in the subway wanted to hear me doing stand-up <laughs> comedy. So it was really difficult. It was really out of my comfort zone. It's yeah. got to be a little uncomfortable because yeah. no one's ever done it before. So it's got to be uncomfortable. And I had to really tighten up my jokes super hard to get anybody to laugh. And that was an experiment that helped me improve my one-liners. And by the way, it also became a story I could tell or a story I could write about. One of the things that I was talking about recently was with an ex-Marines officer from the UK, and he was talking about his time over in Afghanistan, and he was a Somalia a pirate hunter, Somali pirate hunter was like his second sort of uh, career after he left left work in Afghanistan. And um, he was talking about just how different life is out there. And he said he was talking about singing the praises of travel and new experiences. And what you've suggested to there about the idea generation and how important it is, is you kind of don't really know what you like until you, yeah. until you, you try to do something. And our sample size, the sample size of experiences that we're working with is so it's such a fraction of the total potential number of experiences that you could have as a human, right? Like, unless you try something, how do you know whether you do or don't like it? Right, like, people often think to themselves that they could think, they, they can think their way to their passion. There's no way to figure out what your passion is with just your brain. You have to do things. There's no thinking. You have to actually do in order to know. And that's critical. That's why... That's why travel is interesting. If you're if you're the sort of person who benefits a lot from travel or or you know, if you enjoy traveling, travel to as many places as possible to see where you like, what you like to do, where, what you like to do in each place. For me, I like to ex- experiment with these different ideas because again, I'm not going to know until I do something. I'm not going to know what it's like to write. Like I could think my, uh, of a great plot in my head for a novel, but I'm not going to know what it's like to write a novel unless I sit down and write it. Mm, one of the things... You know, this, I, I, it, it, but by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is a very important distinction because it's the difference between learning something in school and, and the real world. Mm. Because in school, no matter what you do, the thing you're most learning is... The thing you're most learning in a classroom are classroom skills. You can only learn real world skills in the real world. There's no other way. One of the things I've been thinking about recently, we're at the start of the year, new year, new decades, new year's goals. How do I relate my 25 year vision to my five year epoch, to my one year medium term goals, to my daily habits and routines and blah, blah, blah. So I've kind of been swimming in the, the masturbatory world of personal development for the last little while, just because I, I, I do quite like to look at that sort of stuff. And I speak to a lot of the guys on this podcast and um, certainly one of the things that it appears to be there is quite a top-down approach to how you should experiment with your life, that um, getting distracted by shiny things and pivoting, as it's called, that's like that's the, the Silicon Valley term for it, right? It's like you can pivot with your particular brand direction or your particular goals, uh, should only be done at the end of particular review periods because you don't know whether or not you've squeezed everything out of the lemon in the interim. But the problem with that is a lot of passions are emergent, not dictated. You know, like your passions in life aren't, I thought of this thing and then I'll think about how to do the plan and the this, that and the other. I could think it would be fucking great to do a podcast, which I did two years ago. But it wasn't until I did the podcast that I was like, oh, this is actually really, really cool. Get to talk to a lot of interesting people. This is the sort of thing I want to do. And then stupidly at the start of last year, I decided to linchpin myself to a twice a week publishing schedule. But now, now I want to do that. And now I'm like, oh, what can I do three? Should I start doing YouTube videos? Should I start doing short form content and blah, blah, blah. But I don't know until I do that. And I do think a lot of the time we, we consider, I certainly know that I do and the listeners might do as well. I consider the barriers, um, 
not necessarily the barriers to entry, but kind of like the skill set that I need or the amount of planning and understanding that I need in order to be able to get an idea moving. It's like, oh, well, you know, like you, the Trump thing, right? Uh, Trump's card thing. Yeah. Right. Well, if I sit down, if I, if I knock the back end of this week off and I don't go away this weekend, I could maybe sit down and begin to do a plan about what the brand name might be. And then once I've done, do you know, it's so pedestrian and so slow. Whereas it seems like you're just pants off, gear out, jump into the pool, feet first. Here I am. Yeah. This is what we're doing. Yeah. Well, some things though are hard. Like let's say from the podcast, you want to say, well, I'm going to also make it big on YouTube. YouTube videos that really work and the YouTube channels that really work require a, a lot more production value than a podcast usually uh, to succeed. And let's say succeeding means, you know, getting a million views on a, on a YouTube video. And may, and it also requires some consistency. You might have high production value for 50 videos in a row without any success. And then the 51st video becomes wildly successful because you've started to find your voice on YouTube. And, and after that, it's, it's all systems go. And you might say to yourself, you know, you might, this is where you might think, okay, that's not an experiment I'm willing to try because I'm not that into it or or it doesn't excite me that much. Yeah, sure. It'd be great to be, have a 50 million YouTube subscribers, but I just don't want to put the time in right now because I'm enjoying the time I'm doing on other things. So a lot of the experiments I described, I figure out let's make money. Some of those don't, you kind of experiment on what will make money, what doesn't. And like, I always think to myself, man, I wish I did had more presence on YouTube and I try, I experiment a little, but I can see it is going to require more effort than I'm, than my personal compass is telling me to put in. That said, I just started experimenting with TikTok, which is totally different. And I'm kind of enjoying the creativity on TikTok. And so I don't really care how many followers I get or how many views I get. It's just kind of fun. And so, so if I have a, a few free moments, I might try a, another TikTok video or something because it doesn't really require as much, as much effort, as much production value to create a, a decent TikTok video. These low friction, low time and resource investment ideas seem to be the sort of thing that's quite fun to play around with. I have to say, you know, quite embarrassingly, I am, despite being a businessman slash entrepreneur of one kind or another for the last 13 years, I, I'm certainly in the camp that I described, one that maybe moves quite sort of pedestrianly with things, very considered. Um, it's an attention to detail, but it's just, it's, it, it's borderline just like neurotic and, 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 and very restricting when it comes to things like that. I certainly think if I was, um, you know, if I was able to move a little bit more towards that expedited, look, let's, this is, it's an idea. It's an idea. Just have a crack at an idea. Maybe I wonder wonder what it would be like to do salsa dancing. Or I wonder what it would be like if I learned to public spit. Oh, what, blah, blah, blah. And I just fucking go to a class. Like, don't think about it. Don't research which yeah. is the best class. Like, just go to the class. Yeah, totally. Like, uh, a couple of years ago, I was, I took uh, a bunch of ping pong lessons, by the way. And I, is then this so I you took, could get good at spin? Uh, potentially. I was already pretty good, <laughs> but I wanted to get better. And, um, I uh, uh, I took classes and other things, and then I wanted to also. This was going to be the year I was going to sit down and write a novel. I've written a lot of nonfiction books. I hadn't written a novel, and then one day, I went up on stage and did stand up comedy at a comedy club, and I loved it. And so, I, if I had made myself a goal uh, this year, I'm doing a novel, and nothing's going to get in the way, and I'm not going to be distracted by shiny objects. I never would have tried stand up comedy. And I loved doing it and it, was, and it was a difficult skill to learn, but I decided, you know what? I love this so much. My, my, my inner compass is telling me this is a direction to go. So I said, okay, no novel. And I'm just going to focus on this. And it's like five years later, I'm still, you know, actually I'm headlining at a major club in New York city, uh, this weekend. So, Congratulations, you know, man. That's thank in- you. That's incredible. Yeah. And so your, your inner compass kind of tells you which directions to go. And I, I gave up the ping pong classes. I gave up some other things I was trying, uh, gave up writing the novel and focused on this, on this one thing without it hurting my business. I run an entire business without it hurting my business. So, cause you know, stand up comedies <laughs> at night and the business is during the day. Mm-hmm. 
I think, again, having looked at the, the productivity world, and the listeners will be familiar with this, that they say your true calling in life is at the intersection of uh, what you're good at, what you love to do, what you can be paid for, and what society needs. And trying to create this Venn diagram and map on this sort of weird polygon with all of the different attributes of whatever it is that you do and blah, blah, it does feel like kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit with this stuff it's like look like if you just if you just do the thing if you just make the experiment reality will reflect back to you whether or not it's a good idea your visceral day-to-day experience of it will tell you whether or not you enjoy it the success that you have in it will tell you whether or not you're any good at it right because because think about like let's take that greenland experiment i did i did earlier the world didn't need me to do it and uh, I wasn't necessarily good at it. Uh, you don't really know anything until you start doing it and there's result, you get some feedback and you and the feedback's good enough that you're like, oh, I want to keep doing it. Look, here I am five years into the comedy thing. The world certainly doesn't need me <laughs> telling jokes to them. And the world has has not decided yet to pay me for it. So it's a matter of, uh, you don't really, you don't really know what that Venn diagram looks like until you're already there, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then, and, 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 so you just have to kind of like try things and follow your heart. And this doesn't mean quit your job and only do things you love. It, but, but it does mean experiment a lot. Experiment in some things that make money right away. Experiment in some things that might make money ten years in the future. By the way, it's the intersection of all of your interests where you'll probably find you make the most amount of money in the end. So you have to have though interest that you get good at to have an intersection to those things until you even know what's going to happen at that intersection. It's a unique offering, isn't it? You know, this is one of the, one of the things that I think about the totality of our experience. And as, as you get older, you know, I've just, I'm 31, I'm 32 this year and I'm getting to the stage now where I'm able to actually genuinely say that I have like a curated list of different, different interests. Cause like at 25, you just get ragged around by life. It's like, Oh, I found myself in a ping pong club. And then one time I fell into a swimming pool and I swam for a bit. Like you don't, the, 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 um, uh, range, the broadness of your perspective of life experiences. There's not, I don't feel like you have enough time to be able to piece together. Oh, well, this is a commonality between this and this. And oh shit, I actually know a guy that oh, is a chef in a secret restaurant who actually plays ping pong on a weekend and does this. Like, you know, I, it's now starting to at least piece together where I can see some of the commonalities between these different things. And interestingly, I actually did an exercise today that was working out my core values, which I've never done before. And I found that to be really interesting to try and look back at what are the different things all of the all the different stuff that i enjoy in life was involved with one of these five core values it was it was really interesting yeah and 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 you know again what happens is is that trying different things you're going to if you get good or even mildly good or even mediocre at like a bunch of different things that you've been experimenting with you never know when the intersection of those things turns into something huge even if the the pieces never made money for you or never Got huge, but but if everything's aligned with your core values, so that means the intersection should be aligned with your core values. It's gonna it's gonna work out somehow at the intersection. So, for instance, thirty years ago, I started writing every day. I didn't make a I didn't make a single dime on writing until eleven year twelve years later, and I didn't make significant money on writing until maybe three or four years after that, and. But also during the time, you know, about 20 years ago, I started investing professionally. And at first I was very bad at it. <laughs> and then I and then I learned, I came up with ideas to, to learn and get better and better and, and better and better and more and more knowledgeable because I had a very untraditional path towards investing. Like I wasn't a, a, an MB. I never studied it. I had to really learn everything on my own. And after about 10, after about 15 years of that, I combined my writing with my investing skill and experience. And I, by that point I had vast experience investing and knowledge and I created an investment newsletter and that made me a significant amount of money. So that made me far more money than investing ever made me. And that made me far more money than writing ever made me. Actually by now investing has caught up and made me more, but at the time, uh, writing an investment related course, uh, made me a significant amount of money. It's a unique offering, right? 
who else yeah. is there that has that particular blend of experiences? It's one of the things that I, the nuance that I struggle with with all of this is the explore exploit paradigm again. So it's like, look, I don't follow. Um, I don't. I, so, I, for instance, my favorite podcast is Joe Rogan. One of the reasons I listen to yeah. him is because, as far he's as I'm great. concerned, he's the best on the planet at asking. He's the best man on the planet at asking questions. I don't follow someone who is one tenth as good as Joe Rogan, but also has nine other things that he is one tenth as good at Joe Rogan at as well. So, what I'm saying is, we follow people who are at the absolute peak within their industry, or we tend to follow people who are the very best within each individual section. And I know that there would be some people who would say, well, it's all well and good saying that you're going to experiment and that you can play around with shiny things, but you're going to get outcompeted by the person who has one fewer thing to do than you do and dedicates the same proportion of their time to it. Right. But let's say, you know, let's say, you know, you found your Joe Rogan's your favorite for an interview podcast. So let's say someone came along who was a better interviewer than Joe Rogan. Uh, you probably wouldn't switch from Joe Rogan to this other guy because you like Joe Rogan and you like his style and you, you, you got to know his story through watching hundreds of his podcasts. But let's say now uh, there was a great podcast that was a, um, they were telling a serial story about a murder mystery and, you know, they would call people up and it was a real, real true crime. Have you, and listened, they were to, calling people up. Have you listened to Up and Vanished, James? Oh, no. Oh, man. No, is it, is it good? Up and Vanished is my, it's, it's quite, it's like maybe three or four years old. The guy, Payne Lindsay, the guy that created it is just out of this world. This is a real life 10 year old missing person inquiry that had gone cold and Payne Lindsay, this guy's just like, oh, I just fancy starting a podcast about this this thing and starts doing it and then is investigating week on week as he's releasing episodes. So he's iterating live, releasing an episode about what happened in the last week. Then there's a discussion forum. Then he starts doing live Q and A's. Then he gets like legal experts in to do extra episodes in between these ones where they'll review the evidence, the case evidence. And then at the end of season one, which remember, this is, wasn't planned. This isn't like some sort of storyline with a fucking arc at the end of season one, they're going to trial. Wow, man! I'll link you to it once we're finished. It it is phenomenal. But yes, yeah, so but we, this, but this is a great example of what I'm talking about. Like I'm assuming that guy is a very good interviewer because he's able to interview enough to talk to witnesses and other people possibly involved in the crime and so on. So he's a good interviewer. But he probably said to himself, "You know what? I don't want to do an interview podcast. There's already Joe Rogan. There's already other people out there doing that." Even if I was better than them, nobody really knows if I'm better or not. Nobody could tell the difference between 20% better and and 20% worse. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something completely different. You can't you can't succeed by just being better. You have to be different also. So so that was the way he he thought about doing a podcast, and that was the right approach. Like and that's why he's much. If he had just done an interview podcast, he'd be like the other 500,000 mm-hmm. interview podcasts. I get you. So what we've kind of swam around here is what we discussed before the podcast. Something that I think you've been thinking about a fair bit recently. Although I get the impression that you think about a lot of different things as well. So it, it, you, you, this may be like a, an eon away from you now. But am I right in thinking that you're working on uh, how you can jump the queue? with progress in life at the moment. Yeah, because yeah, so we live in like you you mentioned before like we're 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 having because of this world of abundance possibly there's this opportunity for an existential crisis. Like why are we here? What should we do? And I don't think we're having that like just because there's less, you know, factory jobs doesn't mean we're struggling with our purpose in life. Most people didn't really want to work in the factory anyway, but uh I do think that the life is complex enough that we're switching careers and passions and interests very often in our lives. So I've probably switched careers 12 different times in in my life and I'll probably switch it 12 different times again, who knows? And you always have to say, well, but wait, I'm 40 or I'm 45 or I'm 60 or I'm 70. How am I going to possibly get started on playing golf now? I'm never going to be the best golf player in the world. So so a, you have to, you have to figure out. Well, what's what's the metrics for success in my new interest? Like, why do I want to do this? And not a, not as a goal, but just like, how do I determine if I'm making progress or do I want progress? And then, um, if you do want progress, 
there's always a hierarchy. There are people who are at the worst and there are people who are the best and there's a hierarchy from, from first to last. So if you want to write a book, sure, you could write a book and never publish it, or you could write a book and self-publish it and have no sales, or you could write a book, self-publish it, have lots of sales, or you can write a book and get huge advances and sell millions of copies and so on. So you have to kind of decide where in the hierarchy, you know, you, you, you kind of want to be. And then no matter what it is, unless it's like, you know, you're 70 years old and you want to be a professional basketball player, which is, you have to be realistic also, but let's say you have realistic metrics, then you have to decide, everyone's going to tell you you're too old, or you've got to do this for 20 years at least, or the 10,000 hour rule, you got to do it for 10,000 hours before you're in the top 1% of, of whatever hierarchy you're, you're joining, uh, whether it's professional this or, or professional ping pong or whatever comedy and comedy. And, and my theory is, is that the 10,000 hour rule only works for very repetitive tasks, uh, like memorizing strings of numbers, for instance, or playing the piano, which has of course there's artistic component of playing the piano, but a lot of it is repetitive, just playing over and over again, uh, the same pieces. And that's how you learn and you get feedback. You do, you get feedback from an instructor and then you play it again, you get feedback, you play it again. But my theory is you could skip the line with what, what I call the 10,000 experiment rule, which is, and there's various types of experiments you could do that are better than others. But essentially every time you do an experiment in, in the area that you're interested in, you'll learn something you'll get better and you'll also start differentiating yourself and finding your own unique way of doing something that's different from everyone else. So for instance, um, you know, with, with, with comedy, there's a, a British comedian who I admire a lot. His name's Chris Turner. And he has what I call, he has skipped the line. So what he did was he, he's been doing stand up comedy. He's 27 years old. So nobody would say, nobody in the comedy world would traditionally say, Oh, he's 27 years old doing comedy. He should be the, you know, starring in every comedy club in the world. No, he's, they would say, no, he's got to do it a few more years. But he also, if you give him five completely random words, he will do the most um, within seconds of thinking about it. He will do the most amazing freestyle rap on the fly. It'll be, and, and rap won't just be like rhyming the words. He'll, it'll be so intelligent and so funny and he just made it up and, and I've seen him do it with five random words. Like I came up with the random words and he just did it right there. And now he's performs in any comedy club in the world that he wants to, because he's, he's not just a stand up comedian. He also has this other skill. He, he differentiated himself. He skipped the line because he experimented with combining his interest in rapping with stand up comedy. And that's given him this unique voice in the stand-up comedy world. Nobody else on the planet does that like he does. Mm. And and particularly as intelligently as he does. Like even if someone else rapped, they can't do it as intelligently as he does. He's super smart. And so, you know, that's an example. And so for me, I've been able to skip the line somewhat instead. Like I said, I'm, I'm headlining at a Caroline's on Broadway on Saturday. Uh, I've been able to skip the line because in part, I've, I've made it a lifelong effort to learn how to learn so I could pick up lots of different interests and learn very quickly. So I, I would start to use that technique on comedy. And then I combined my podcast with that where I had some of the best comedians in the world on my podcast. And so I'm able to ask them any question I want. Like I'll think about the difficulties I've been having the past week in comedy. And let's say I have this world famous comedian on. I'll say, well, what if this, this, this and this happened to you? <laughs> what would you do? Now, nobody else gets that opportunity to ask the top comedians very specific situations about how they would respond. I've gotten I've I, every time they answer a question like that, it's like I skip months and months or years of learning and whatever it is I'm asking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I've had other opportunities like that to that, you know, has helped me skip the line quite a bit. Are there some principles or some foundations to skipping the line that are universal or be universally helpful. So I can think of some, one of them would probably be having some form of a platform online or some kind of notoriety that allows you to reach people. You know, that's enabled you to do certain things. 
get better podcast guests, um, you know, get when you release a GoFundMe to try and buy Greenland, uh, to garner a little bit of media attention, which then kind of becomes self perpetuating and blah, blah. You mentioned about your ability learning to learn and stuff like that. Are there any other sort of foundational elements to this? Well, I think foundational is come exercising that creativity muscle and keeping the rest of your lives healthy, emotional, physical, and so on. But when you exercise that creativity muscle, you're able to come up with experiments. What can I, how can I experiment to improve this aspect of my knowledge or life or whatever? So for instance, with comedy, again, I was having a hard time coming up with one liners. Like I'm, I'm a public speaker for a long time. So that means I'm good at storytelling and humorous storytelling, but coming up with one liners, it's one sentence that gets people to laugh. That wasn't an expertise of mine. So what I did was, here's an experiment I did. It took a half hour. I went onto a subway, you know, an underground mm-hmm. train, you know, a subway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in ev- every stop, I moved from car to car in the subway. And I would do stand-up comedy in the subway. And now no other person sitting in the subway wanted to hear me doing stand-up <laughs> comedy. So it was really difficult. It was really out of my comfort zone. You have to be a little out of your comfort zone. It's yeah. got to be a little uncomfortable because yeah. no one's ever done it before. So it's got to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I had to really tighten up my jokes super hard to get to get anybody to laugh. And that was an experiment that helped me improve my one-liners. And by the way, it also became a story I could tell or a story I could write about. Mm. And in fact, I expanded it even further. I, I created the entire format of a late night TV show and I had on a guest. I had on a musical guest all in the subway, you know, audience participation where I'd interview people uh, sitting in the subway because I was starting to get really comfortable with talking with people on the subway. Yeah. And so and, you know, that experiment didn't really work in the sense that I, you know, I put up a video of my. Um, my late night talk show in the subway format. And, you know, I could have kept doing that and made it like a real show, but it, I didn't really want to. But at least it was an experiment. I had to study the late night format. I had to get get better at one liners. Again, not great because you'll never be great down there. Mm. And uh, uh, and it was fun. And then I have a story to tell from it. And look, if that first one was huge, that would have been a different story. Mm-hmm. It's um the, the the main thing that I've got in my mind is for the listeners, I'm going to break the fourth wall for a second. Uh, it, James's sound guy, the guy that sets up his sound is called Jay. And all I've got in the back of my mind when you're talking about this subway thing is the nightmare that sound guy Jay would have with capturing clean audio. I've yeah. just got, well, I'm just thinking like Jay's, Jay's going to have to like, James has decided to have this idea and poor Jay's there lugging along an entire sound desk in a desperate attempt to try and drown out the sound of the subway's wheels on metal. I mean, the good thing is though, you could caption. So we captioned things and, uh, yeah. had mics on and, and so on. But it was, again, it was a fun cause I did videotape it because that's the other thing too, is you want to be able to have some way of measuring your experiment. So I, for, so for instance, when I do comedy, I videotape it so I could watch it later. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try to do that every time. I don't always do it, but I, I try to do it, uh, because you have to be able to measure your, your progress. But, uh, uh, again, like with, with anything, like even with a podcast. So I do two interview podcasts a week with, with guests, usually guests who are somewhat celebrities, famous, whatever, but I'm experimenting with format too. So I'm trying I'm about to start trying a format that instead of it being an hour or two hours, it's 15 minutes where I just tell a little story and maybe there's a co-host who just asks basic questions and then in 15, 20 minutes, it's done. So actually we just did one. It was a little more than 15 minutes, but I had never done this before. I ran the whole Iran situation happened over the weekend. So Sunday I call, I wanted to know more and I assume my audience wanted to know more. So I called up a top a uh, military intelligence official. I got the complete breakdown about what was happening. And I ran that the, the very next day on Monday mm. and I had never done anything like that was an experiment. I never done that before. And that will be my most downloaded episode in the past two months. Wow. How cool is that? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the short form thing on audio is really interesting. I was having a discussion with Matt from podcast notes who I know will be listening. And, uh, I, uh, I couldn't work out. I, I like, I, it's such a, a wild west at the moment with this, but I can totally see a place for it. You know, Nav- like Naval was doing those three minute long 
podcast that was a part of his uh, How to Get Rich Without Getting Lucky um, series. And you're like, who, who listens to these three-minute podcasts? But then at the end of it, when he creates a three-and-a-half-hour omnibus collage thing of them all, you're actually like, oh, well, yeah, actually... It kind of makes a bit of sense. So we talked yeah. about we talked about skipping the line. We've talked about the fact that experimenting is an important part of that. What else? What else have you been thinking about to do with skipping the line recently? Well, another thing that's important is to to you know whenever you're in a line or whenever you're trying to succeed at something, as I mentioned earlier, there's a hierarchy. There's there's the worst going all the way up to the best. The best all the, going all the way down to the worst, and the best tends to look down at the worst and whatever. You, you know where you are in the hierarchy. Where, where primates, primates tend to know where they, where they are in the hierarchy. The benefit of being human is we could diversify our hierarchies as opposed to being stuck in one tribe. But, uh, uh, you know, there's all sorts of interesting techniques. So, for instance, what if you're trying to succeed at something, but you take a step back and take a lower job become the big fish in a smaller pond, but that allows you to then skip four steps forward when, um, because you become known as the best in this smaller pond. What's an example so, of that? So a friend of mine uh, was a lawyer and he finished his law degree and he wanted to be in the CIA and you know the Central Intelligence Agency. And he, he, he couldn't for whatever reason. So he took an internship usually set aside for people still in their undergrad years, like the first or second year undergrad. Here he was as a lawyer or he went to grad school, got a law degree, whatever. He took an internship with the secret service and they were like, what are you, the secret service, the secret service is the um, part of the white house that protects the president. It's like the guard. And they were like, why do you want to be in the internship program? That's only for teenagers. You're already a lawyer. And he's like, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm really interested. So they let him in. And because he was a lawyer, he was able to deliver legal documents to the president occasionally. And in order to do that, he had to get top secret clearance. So now he's the only intern ever who has top secret clearance. So he uses that to suddenly uh, get a job at, I think it was actually, I think it was maybe the FBI or the CIA. I forget the exact details, but he, he got a job at the internship program for the CIA because nobody in the internship program there had top secret clearance and was a lawyer. And then using that in his spare time, he would listen around he would look for what are opportunities. Oh, his boss's boss's boss was looking for some potential terrorist. He tracked, he had time. He tracked the person down. So now he pleased his boss's boss's boss. This guy said, who are you? <laughs> well, I'm an intern. I'm an intern, but I happen to be the only intern with top secret clearance and I'm a lawyer. So he got quickly promoted up to the CIA. So he moved much faster. He skipped the line right where he wanted to be at the CIA by taking two steps backward each time. And that's another interesting technique is to keep your ego out of it. Uh, sometimes you got to take two steps backward to succeed four steps forward. <laughs> Such a good story. I wonder how much, do you think that he had that perfect plan at the time? Because, you know, with hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, it sounds like the most masterful idea in history. I don't know if he had that plan in time, although I will ask him. Uh, and But I've known other people who have done similar things. It, it always seems to be a pretty good technique that works. Like, uh, you, do you know Ryan Holiday and Ryan Holiday's books? So Ryan Holiday's a great writer. He's written several New York Times bestsellers. His last book, Stillness is the Key, uh, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. It came out a few months ago. But he started off he quit college and he started off, he just wanted to be an apprentice. He helped He helped the author Robert Greene do research. So Robert Greene wrote 48 Laws of Power and some other great books. He, he simply did was like a research assistant for Robert Greene, but he did really well at that. And then Robert Greene recommended to another company that Ryan should be their um, head of, you know, uh, uh, you know, help run marketing. He ended up being so good at that, he became the head of marketing. But then he took another step back. He became intern for another writer. He learned a lot. Um, he became, he, he started helping Tim Ferriss with his marketing cause his combination of writing internships with, you know, marketing experience, he helped Tim Ferriss. And then suddenly he wrote a book. He knew all the right agents. He knew how to market it. He knew how to distribute it and his books became bestsellers. So, you know, that was a great case of moving a couple steps backward to achieve his goal. 
He's a legit man. Robert yeah. is a past past modern wisdom guest, and he's 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 a fantastic guy as well. I mean, that is one baptism of fire I can imagine, especially seeing the size of Robert Greene's books, like Forty Eight Laws of Powers, and the thirty hours long. I think it's on Audible, something like Probably. that. It's an absolute yeah. tome and a half. So there's, I can just imagine like a poor young, slightly spotty Ryan Holiday like running around. Going and getting like going into dusty shelves, getting stuff down off the library. Yeah, and and he learned a lot. Like, and you could see the results of Robert Greene's teaching and the way Ryan puts together books. So it's a it's a it's a great technique. I mean, for me, I worked at a television company, HBO, and my goal I wanted to make TV shows, but I couldn't get a job making TV shows for HBO. I had no experience, so I took a job as a junior software programmer for HBO. I was just in the so- in the IT department, the software department, and but my foot was in the door. So I pitched to them, "Hey, why don't we make an original web show for the internet?" And they said, "Of course, that's a great idea." And so then I took that original web show, I showed how much traffic it was getting, and I used it to pitch an actual TV show and they gave me money to shoot it as a pilot. So Man, again, that cool. was my that was my way of skipping the line. Like I was the only programmer ever <laughs> in the IT department to be shooting a pilot for HBO. Here's an idea that I've had recently. Um, So I'm starting to do some productivity and leadership coaching within some companies. Uh, One's in Germany, one's in actually in New York. Um, So hopefully I'll be over later this year. Uh, And one of the ideas that I've been thinking about to just speak to new clients and to kind of just learn what it's like to give a speech to a room, I haven't done a massive amount of public speaking, was I was thinking of just cold emailing a bunch of big businesses who have high-powered sales floors, execs, you know, like real real sort of go-getter companies, and just saying, look, do you want me to come in and just give a one-hour presentation on how everybody in this office can be more productive if they use a few tools and go about it with a, a couple of different different approaches to the way that they view their productivity? And I was thinking about that, and I was like, well, that's... That kind of sucks. Like I value my time at more than zero pounds per hour. But on the flip side of that, after doing a few of those, even if no one books me, even if no one decides to get coaching off me, I'll have got a shitload of experience and I'll have got some cool stories and maybe the boss will need a a guy that does a podcast in a couple of months time and a whatever, whatever. Yeah. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think one step easier and maybe better, we'll see, is study the company, study what they might be, what, what maybe they could do better. Do, do your 10 ideas thing and say, oh, uh, here's 10 ideas to improve your sales at this company. I'm not charging anything. I'm happy to come in and talk to you guys or not. Um, but here's 10 ideas. I, I, I'm a customer of your company and I really love your product, but I see where things could be a little better. Here's 10 ideas you could just have for free and they're uniquely catered to you. Uh, knock yourselves out. See you later. And just give for free. And you know what will happen is some of them are going to respond to you and say, Hey, we'd love for you to come in and see what we're up to. And maybe talk to us more about this. Mm. You know, if you write, if you write 20 emails like that, three or four will certainly respond and say, Hey, why don't you come in and, um, hang out a little and, and, and we'll, we'll just talk about this. You had a really interesting example on, uh, impact theory where you were talking about how, there's quite a lot of friction, even when someone thinks that they're doing something nice and they say to you, like, I think your example was, hey, James, like, I'd love to come and be your intern. But then there's actually a whole load of work attached to you. Like, cause now yeah. you've got to find this this intern. Well, what are you what are you good at? What do you want me to do? What are you going to do? Do you clean the floor? Do you check the emails? Do you respond to the Facebooks or whatever? Whereas you were like, look, if you go to someone and you're like, look, ready made, here's 10 ideas of how I can help you. Do you want me to help you? Yeah. Or yeah, exactly. Like if you don't give them homework, like if they, <laughs> if you say I could come in and speak, uh, to you, they got to arrange that now. And, uh, instead I wouldn't even say, here's 10 ideas I could do for you. I would say, here's just 10 ideas to make your life better or make your job better or make your sales better, or whatever. See you later. Nice, nice knowing you. And some people will respond. Like occasionally I get that. Occasionally some people, somebody will send me, Hey, I, I think here's 10 ways your, your website could be better. Or here's 10 ways, here's 10 ideas for your podcast. And, and not just people all the time throw 10 guests at me, but that doesn't help me. But here's (laughs) 10 ways to get, here's 10 ways to get in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And 
that helps me a lot. That's I've, I've met, I've had a lot of meetings where people have definitely offered value in their emails. And I said, okay, let's talk more about this. I love that concept. I think certainly to differentiate yourself, we've been talking a lot about differentiating yourself. How can you use the uniqueness that you have as a person? And one of the most unique things that we have as a, as people is our networks, right? Like there's only you, there is precisely only you that knows all of the people on the planet that you know. And now you know right. one more because you know me. Like right. it's precisely you and that is it. So the power of networking, when you look at that, is it is one way to outcompete every single other person is to utilize right. and, your networking correctly. And here's the thing, what people don't realize. This is the difference between linear power from your network and exponential power from your network. So I can view my network as, me, let's say I know 100 people. I, there's like, draw a line between me and all those 100 people. That's 100 lines. But now what if you draw lines between all of them, not, not even including you? So, so let's say you give your, your connections to your entire network. So now instead of 100 lines, there's 10,000 lines because all 100 are connected to all other 100. And that's when you introduce two people that you think could help each other, they're not going to forget who introduced them. Mm -hmm. You're still there, even though it's a little more vague. Yep. You're still in that connection there. And that's the real power of your network is when you give each e each other to each other. And, and, and it's the same thing with ideas. You just got to like view an idea as a component of your network. Give your ideas freely to people who you think could use them and who would be receptive to them. And give it in as a simple way as possible so there's no work on their part. So for instance, the very first time I got paid for writing anything, I wrote to a guy who was a writer and I said, here's 10, I, I love your articles, but here's 10 ideas for articles I would love to see you write. And I described the articles completely. So it would be almost trivial for him to write the articles. <laughs> and, and, and he wrote back and he said, these are great. Why don't you write the articles? And that was the very first professional writing gig I ever had. That's awesome. That's such a good example. Uh, yeah, as you were talking about how you're linking people in together, I was thinking about Kamal, mutual friend of mine and yours, and Michael Kaju, who all of the, the listeners will know, CEO of Brute Strength, and I linked both of those in yesterday. I was like, just chatting to Michael about something, and it just came into my head. I was like, fuck, you need to get Kamal on the Brute Strength podcast. Link them in, and now now they're away. Michael, I sent, this is a cool one. So I had Aubrey on the show um, Aubrey Marcus is the most yeah. difficult man on the planet to get hold of, by the way. But his assistant managed to get in with him. And he's in Austin. And Michael, my buddy, CEO of Brute Strength in Austin. And Michael's like kind of into this self-development space as well. And him and his missus, Adi, they do loads of stuff. And I was like, it would be awesome. You should totally link up at on it. Then they, he went, Michael went. And I think Michael's wife went and did a podcast with uh, Aubrey's uh, ex-missus, Whitney. And now, and I was like the exponential thing. I didn't even link those two people in, but because of the first iteration of that, and then, you know, it's, it is a, and it's a good feeling as well. It's, so, it's, it's, it's valuable because it makes you part of the club. It makes you part of the scene that everyone else is trying to build. Mm -hmm. And it's really important. It's an important skill in today's society to kind of not feel scarce about your network. Like, well, I don't want him knowing him. I only want to know each, each of them. Like even the first time you and I spoke, I didn't know you were going to have, I didn't know you knew Kamal. And I said, oh, you should have Kamal on your podcast. Like just having a reflex of just anybody who can help anybody else, just mm -hmm. don't hold back. Like it's a world of abundance and, and don't be afraid of, of losing connections by giving them to someone else. That's not how it works. You don't really give a connection to someone else. You copy the connection and give the copy to someone. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to put it. Look, James, man, we've been going for forever. I've taken up so much of your day, but it's... Um, it's been great. I, I Thank you so much. This is a great podcast. Uh, you, you're a great interviewer, and uh, I was really happy to come on. It's been an absolute pleasure. If the listeners want to find out more, where, where should they go to hassle you online or find out your stuff? Uh, check out my podcast, The James Altucher Show. We'll be linked in the show notes below, as will Choose Yourself on Amazon. You know what to do if you've enjoyed the episode. Like, share, and subscribe. Definitely go and check out James's podcast. Man, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I will talk to you soon.